All right, well, um, so yeah, the theme obviously of the day is uh, climate change and carbon. And so I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit about an overview of uh, a resource that our group has developed to help natural resource managers and foresters consider actions they can take to support both climate adaptation and carbon in, uh, in forests. So as we all understand, you know, forests are really important for carbon. Um, here's a couple of quick um, and interesting stats, I think, on, um, on kind of putting some numbers on that importance. So U.S. forests uh, absorb about 15% of the CO2 that we release annually um, from burning of fossil fuels. Forests in, in the U.S. Uh, store almost 70% of our terrestrial carbon stocks. So a huge portion of, of the um, carbon on the land base. And our about 90% of the land sector's capacity to sequester carbon. So, so hugely important. Um, now we, we recognize that climate change, you know, offers some opportunities for uh, kind of enhancing that through longer growing seasons and CO2 fertilization effects. Um, so, you know, the higher CO2 levels mean that trees can sometimes grow faster. Um, but the major concern as, you know, as we, as Danielle um, talked about in the last presentation is that changing climate presents a lot of risks um, for all that carbon that forests store and, um, and for all the carbon that they sequester as well, right? And so, um, so that's really the major concern. And I wanna just kind of um, pause here, I guess a little bit and, and just kind of unpack that, uh, that I idea of carbon a little bit. Um, People oftentimes use the term sequestration or storage or, or mitigation. And so I just wanted to kind of address this and because people oftentimes think these things are, are sort of interchangeable or, or mean the same thing, um, but really they aren't. They're, they're two different things um, and they really sort of mean different things when you're thinking about carbon cycling and carbon um, sequestration. So carbon storage, you know, is the amount of carbon that is retained in a carbon pool. So things like live trees, um, carbon in the soil, these are, these are sort of what we call pools. Um, and, you know, they're really important because if that carbon is released through some kind of disturbance, then that carbon then goes back to the atmosphere and then further, um, increases uh, atmospheric CO2 concentrations driving climate change. On the other hand, carbon sequestration um, is from an ecological perspective, it's really talking about uh, a flux. It's talking about the process of plants um, taking CO2 from the atmosphere and, and, and um, putting it into biomass through the process of photosynthesis. Um, and so, as opposed to storage, which is a pool, sequestration is a flux. So, and that flux has a rate. And so, you know, we typically think about how, uh, how we can optimize that rate in order to mitigate, you know, better mitigate some portion of the carbon that we're emitting to the atmosphere. So, um, sometimes I get asked the question, you know, should I be managing my forest for incre increasing sequestration or for storage? And my answer to that typically is yes. <laughs> so we, we really, we want both of these. They're both important. Um, obviously carbon that is sequestered then contributes to greater storage. So they're, those processes, these two things are linked together, but we really need both to effectively be able to mitigate climate change. And what makes sense for management, um, for, for climate mitigation really depends upon your site conditions and, and sort of what, uh, how your forest may best contribute. Okay, so kind of going back to this idea of, you know, of, of climate, you can see it's really about both 
the impacts of climate change on carbon storage and carbon sequestration and, and the risks that climate change poses for that. Um, so adaptation actions are things that we can do to, to intentionally you know, minimize those climate risks while still working to meet our project goals and objectives. And, and if, if any of you have, have taken you know, a look at some of our uh, adaptation resources or um, taken the online course, a lot of the, what I'm gonna say in the next few slides is gonna sound very familiar, um, but I'm gonna give kind of a, a brief overview of these adaptation resources um, quickly in the next couple of slides. So as, as Danielle mentioned before, there, there really is no silver bullet or one size fits all approach to adaptation. Um, and so our group developed the adaptation resources to provide a flexible approach to accommodate all this diversity um, in you know, what are the management goals that people have, um, different land ownerships, different forest types, kind of taking all that, that diversity that we have out there in terms of forest management um, and providing a resource that is flexible to be um, useful for, for everyone. So these resources consist of two main uh, tools. One is the adaptation workbook and the other is adaptation strategies and approaches for different resource areas. Uh, which we call menus. Uh, so here's a quick snapshot of the adaptation workbook. It's a structured yet flexible process um, that's designed really to help people integrate climate change into management planning kind of by breaking it down into bite-sized chunks. Uh, it allows managers to kind of go through this logical thought process of first kind of defining what you're where you're working and what your management objectives are in the first step, um, using vulnerability assessments, like the great information that Wiki has out there, um, the scientific literature, all these things to assess what the impacts of climate change will be on your particular project area. Um, evaluate what that means then in the third step for, for meeting your goals. Uh, and then in that fourth step, using these menus of adaptation strategies and approaches to identify what actions you can do to minimize the climate risks. And then finally, um, identify how you can monitor to evaluate the effectiveness of what you're actually doing on the ground. And we call this the adaptation workbook because it's actually a workbook. We have uh, worksheets that you can find in that GTR that is uh, the Swanston et al publication at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we also have an online workbook. Um, we use that online workbook in that seven week online training that Danielle talked about. Um, the second resource then is these menus of adaptation strategies and approaches, which really are a collection of kind of all the plausible actions that a manager could take um, that is relevant or appropriate for their particular location or their set of conditions. Um, and so, you know, these menus are intended to be really thorough, comprehensive um, sets of actions that sort of like a, a menu at a restaurant, you know, you wouldn't choose everything on them. Um, there, in fact, our menus have opposing ideas in them so that a manager in sort of one set of conditions would find something there appropriate for their forest and a manager in an entirely different set of conditions will also find something that's appropriate for their, uh, their conditions. <clears throat> the menus translate broad concepts of, of adaptation into specific tangible actions by taking that comprehensive synthesis that we provide and then, and then giving it to people in sort of a tiered structure that organizes the information, right? So at the highest level of our adaptation concepts um, or adaptation I options that, um, you know, kind of build off of these concepts of resistance uh, resisting climate impacts or uh, resilience, that, that rubber band idea that, that Danielle talked about and is kind of the foundation of a lot of sustainable forest management, um, as well as transition. So kind of intentionally transitioning the system to something different that's 
adapted to future conditions. Um, <clears throat> and so then below those adaptation options are strategies. These are kind of um, broad ideas that could be applicable across a wide uh, variety of places or resources. Underneath each strategy are different approaches, which are kind of more specific responses. Um, that's where the menus kind of end as, as at the approach level. And then it's up to the manager to identify the tactic or the, the really um, prescriptive action that falls underneath that specific approach. And by, by doing this in this kind of tiered organization, these strategies and approaches really are designed to serve as stepping stones um, to enable managers to, to kind of walk through that process and translate broad ideas into prescriptive actions that they can actually implement. Um, and so using these two resources together, the workbook and the menus, um, you know, that's kind of part of a, a logical train of thought. It helps people connect the dots between sort of what our goals are over here and what our, um, our actions are that we take and, you know, really kind of make our ideas more specific, um, connecting those ideas to the specific climate vulnerabilities or, or risks or challenges that we face, um, and essentially kind of plan with intentionality. Um, what we plan on doing. <clears throat> okay, so over the years of working with forest managers um, on adaptation planning, you know, we've, we've had people kind of keep asking about what actions can they be taking to be managing their forests for carbon benefits, um, storage and sequestration in light of a changing climate. And you know, so we recognize that sort of on one side or on one hand, there's there's this whole body of literature that discusses how to manage forests for, for carbon, but doesn't really take into consideration climate change. On the other hand, there are these resources, some of which you know, our group at NIACS developed that discuss adaptation, but don't really speak to carbon management. Um, and so you know, we recognize that there was a need for a resource that really blended um, these, these two ideas together. Um, and so we, um, we kind of took this idea and, and sort of based on the foundation of, of integrating um, mitigation and adaptation together, you know, recognizing that, that, that finding that commonality between those two things, finding that, that overlap between adaptation and mitigation was absolutely critical for robust and resilient carbon storage and sequestration. And so if we can identify practices that contribute to both mitigation and adaptation, you know, we can hopefully sustain or even enhance the long-term carbon value of forests into the future, despite all of those risks of climate change. Um, so, so we created this menu, which, you know, the long, Long name is a practitioner's menu of adaptation of strategies and approaches for forest carbon management. I just for short, call it the forest carbon management menu. Um, but it was developed through an extensive review of over 200 sources of, of literature, you know, from peer reviewed science articles, book chapters, GTRs, gray literature all things that we could find that cover kind of what are the carbon implications of forest management, of climate change, and of natural disturbance. Um, so like other menus, this resource, you know, helps people connect the dots of their actions um, to both adaptation and mitigation concepts. <clears throat> so for example, you know, something that you would do that would sustain ecosystem function has adaptation value for its ability to help a forest resist stressors such as a uh, insect pest, which then in turn has mitigation value for protecting those carbon stocks. Uh, likewise, things like diversifying species composition can build resilience, so has adaptation value there, but also has mitigation value then because it enhances the future um, carbon uptake of, of a forest. Um, so you can find the forest carbon management menu on that uh, 
URL, forestadaptation.org um, forward slash carbon. It was also published in the Journal of Forestry. So um, if you go to that tree search link, you should be able to find uh, the, the paper as well. So um, a couple of sort of high level things that I think kind of make this resource unique and really help people to, to find that overlap between mitigation and adaptation are um, it, it helps managers, the menu helps managers, you know, using it with a workbook, intentionally consider the vulnerability of their forests from a whole variety of, of climate impacts. So, you know, consider what those impacts mean for, for carbon um, and then, you know, take, take action, you know, make adjustments to their management to then minimize those risks. So vulnerability can come from a whole, you know, host of things, a lot of which, you know, we've already kind of talked about, but like vulnerability to large scale events that create, you know, catastrophic carbon losses wind events like the derechos, um, uh, wildfires in the west certainly, but even, you know, um, in, in our region, you know, fire is something that has caused in historically large-scale carbon losses. Um, Danielle talked about the, the changes in, in tree habitat suitability, and, and so, you know, depending upon where you are in the state, um, you know, this habitat suitability for a particular species may, may um, be decreasing or increasing. And so that we may need to kind of take that into consideration. And then of course, um, we're always concerned about and, and thinking about uh, tree mortality risks from non-native insect pests, things like emerald ash borer, um, hemlock woolly adelgid, things like that. And I've got sort of little vignettes about how um, how, peop, how managers have kind of taken this information. I'm, I have slides at the end. If we have time, we can go into that. But I, I wanted to make sure that I didn't run over on time and, and that I could kind of address some uh, questions that people might have about carbon management. So the second thing um, that I just want to talk about then is, is sort of um, how the menu really helps people to consider an array of options that they might not have originally been thinking about. Um, you know, essentially helps them, helps people kind of think outside of the box to see unseen opportunities um, to maintain or enhance both their carbon benefits, but also those other important co-benefits, things like water and wildlife habitat. Um, and so one example is that, you know, for carbon, we oftentimes think about tree biomass, um, but the menu is really also has an emphasis of helping people to think about soil carbon, um, you know, carbon in standing dead trees or snags or in coarse woody debris. So there's a lot of things that we could be doing in management to be enhancing those carbon pools as well. Um, thinking about you know, how can we enhance forest productivity or regeneration in light of climate change? And then how do these things also contribute to other important benefits like enhancing wildlife habitat? You know, tree bird or uh, forest bird habitat, those sorts of things. And we've got a lot of examples um, that, that kind of highlight how managers are, are doing this. Um, but I wanted to spend the last um, little bit uh, uh, covering some kind of frequently asked questions that, that I've gotten over uh, the last couple of years of, of working with folks um, to help them integrate uh, adaptation and mitigation. And then once we get through this, maybe I can, um, if we've got some time, um, I can kind of go through some of those examples as well. And we are going to have after this presentation and, and a Q&A session then we'll go back and, and kind of go through an actual case study so you can really kind of see how the menu and the adaptation workbook work together. Um, so the first question that people often ask is just kind of about, you know, how do forests uh, sequester or accrue carbon over time? And do they, you know, do they sequester carbon, you know, forever? Um, and so, you know, 
part of that depends upon what you mean by uh, accruing or sequestering. Um, so I just, you know, kind of refer back to that figure that we looked at before. Um, are we talking about storing carbon? Are we talking about actually the process of sequestering carbon? Um, and so, you know, it, it depends upon what you mean by that. Um, but on the on the on the right-hand side here, I'm showing some some data from FIA for different forest types in the lake states, and showing that line shows that the sequestration rate, so how much carbon is being um, sequestered by by forests over time, um, over different age classes, and then the bars show how much carbon is stored in those forests. And what you can see is that, you know, not surprisingly, as forests age their sequestration rate declines over time. Um, and as forest age, their storage rates increase over time. Um, but in the case of um, aspen birch forests, for example, which are, those are sh typically short-lived trees. Um, and so once you get really over that 100 to 120 year old age class, you know, those forests begin to suffer from you know, significant forest health issues, they start breaking up, and you can actually see not only the sequestration rate essentially bottom out, but the storage of, of carbon in those forests start to decline as well as, as trees succumb to, to age-related mortality and pests and those sorts of things, and we may see some, some regeneration failures as well. Um, and so the answer, you know, is sort of like, well, it depends. Um, it depends upon what you mean by sequester and it depends upon your forest type. But um, one, I think, important thing to, to highlight is that there's some, been some more uh, recent uh, work kind of thinking about this question. And, and I've got this quote from a recent paper by Peter Curtis at Ohio State. Um, we had, they had a great paper that came out in 2018 showing that, you know, with this moderate severity disturbances that kind of continually happen in forests um, that, you know, kind of create gaps in the canopy and allow for uh, recruitment into the canopy and regeneration. Um, as that's happening at kind of higher um, than historically typical rates um, in aging forests, that introduces a lot of complexity. Um, both in stand structure, but also um, enhancing species composition by getting light into the forest floor. And that those canopies, as they get more complex, the age structure um, and, and, the, and the vertical structure gets more diverse, um, that we can actually sustain higher sequestration rates in an older forest. So this is a little bit of a shift in the paradigm of that like old forests don't sequester carbon. Um, very well. And we're starting to understand that old forests sequester carbon maybe at, at faster rates than we've previously given them credit for. <clears throat> okay, another question that I hear a lot and not nearly as much in the lake states um, as we do in the northeast, but is, you know, shouldn't we just stop harvesting forests? Shouldn't we just stop cutting trees down um, for carbon? Um, and, and that's something, you know, that there is a very vocal uh, crowd um, kind of be um, asking that question a lot. Um, and so, you know, I, the answer really is complex and I don't have time to get into all the nuances about that. But I think there's just a couple of points that, that I typically uh, bring out to, to people to keep in mind when thinking about this question. And the first is this, there's an, this idea of leakage. So if we stopped harvesting trees, if we stopped, you know, managing forests for harvested wood products, um, the demand doesn't go away. And so there's this idea of leakage. And so that those harvesting actions are just going to take place elsewhere. Um, and so it's not necessarily going to have the benefit overall when you're thinking broadly across the landscape. Uh, of, of increasing carbon storage. Um, and so that's, that's one thing to keep in mind. The second thing to keep in mind is, um, you know, we're thinking about carbon on a particular forest or on a stand scale. Um, yeah, when you don't cut 
trees, you have more carbon, right? And, and so people will oftentimes look at uh, results from study, modeling studies like this is a well-known one from Nunnery and Keaton that came out about 10 years ago where they looked at different forest management scenarios compared to a no management scenario. And you can clearly see that no management scenario has much more carbon in it. And so this obviously says, you know, shows that no management um, stopping harvesting is the best thing to do. Well, <clears throat> there's a whole lot of assumptions and caveats that go into an analysis like this. Um, the biggest one is that most models, virtually all models, assume climate stationarity. They just assume climate change isn't happening. They don't incorporate these projected changes in temperature precipitation. They don't integrate disturbance at all, really. This, this no management scenario is assuming no disturbance happens in this forest, um, let alone increase disturbance frequencies that we know are, are, are happening um, and, and enhance mortality. Um, and so um, it's, it paints a, a much rosier picture than what reality uh, presents. Um, and so I uh, try to redirect people to, to say, I don't think that that's necessarily the question that we should be asking. The question maybe more appropriately is what management practices can we be implementing to reduce our climate risk and increase our carbon compared to what a business as usual management scenario is for that particular stand. Right? And so that business as usual management is really important. It's what we look to in carbon offset projects. Um, that kind of gives us that, that additionality, the, the additional carbon over what we would have had if we just kind of managed um, with our normal management. Um, and, and it really you know, allows us to ask the question of how can we be, you know, increasing the resilience of our forest? How can we be um, helping our forest to become healthier in light of all these changes um, in climate? And, and when we ask that question, um, the answer is, <clears throat> is, I think, much different than what some of these modeling studies will, will, will show. Okay. Um, and then the last question that I am going to address is sort of, you know, I, I, I think a lot of folks on this call are thinking about, you know, forest restoration, about planting trees. And so sometimes they get asked the question, you know, does it matter what type of tree I plant for carbon or, or can I plant anything? And the answer is, of course, it, it does matter. Um, there's a lot of different sort of uh, life history strategies that trees take. Um, we've got examples of fast-growing native trees that sequester carbon quickly, um, but sometimes they produce weak wood that's prone to storm damage or they have short lifespans. Um, just a couple of examples, silver maple, box elder, there's aspen, and birch. Um, so, you know, there's a trade-off. Those trees are really good at the sequestration side of things. On the other side of things, there's slow growing trees that have really carbon dense wood. They're long lived. Um, and so they're really good at the storage side of things, um, but not so good at the sequestration. So some of those things are like some of the oak species, um, some of the hickory species. There, there's a whole bunch of other things that uh, other species that kind of fall into that, you know, good at storing carbon. Um, and then there are things that kind of fall in the, in the middle. And I uh, will say, you know, if, if carbon is really a goal and you're thinking of planting trees, um, you know, you don't have a bunch of bur oak on your site that's currently storing carbon. There's a bunch of carbon rock stars. There are tree species that are large, they grow fast and they're long lived. And so these are things that, you know, you might want to look towards um, things like pin oaks or northern red oaks grow fairly quickly and they're long lived and they're 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 strong and carbon dense sycamore tulip tree black walnut there these are just some examples and it really depends you know of course on where you are um, and so you know this is all to say you know, none of these things would I ever recommend, you know, don't look to the fast growing species or don't 
consider the slow growing species, just recognize that they all have sort of different um, pros and cons in terms of that balance between sequestration and storage. And, um, you know, we want to ideally be looking towards a diversity. We want to be balancing both sequestration and storage. You know, we want to, to have those fast growing species to, to quickly get some, some carbon stored and some tree canopy established and habitat created for, for wildlife. Um, but we also want to be looking toward, you know, we don't want to necessarily put all our eggs in that basket. We look towards some other <clears throat> species that kind of um, give us those storage benefits over the long term. Um, and of course, it's not just about species selection. Management plays a huge and really important role in this question. Um, and so, you know, there are things that we can be doing on, on the management end of things to create conditions where we can be thinking about how to introduce or, or favor existing genotypes or species that are going to be better adapted to future conditions. Um, we can be thinking about how can we be altering um, forest structure or composition to, to really be promoting carbon storage. So um, something like transitioning uh, a plantation, a conifer plantation, to a more natural forest stand that allows for a lot more complexity, a lot more diversity. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes store more carbon. And so, you know, these things that really are, I think are keystone ideas in terms of both adaptation and mitigation, diversity both in structure and species, retaining those existing legacy trees, um, snags, coarse woody debris, um, those things are really important for a whole host of benefits um, as well as carbon. And then, you know, just really emphasizing the idea that you know we want to be matching tree species to the site conditions and, and I'll talk a little bit about this when I go through our case study um, after we have some time for questions but you know sites that have you know different soil types like sandy dry soils versus you know sites that are are um, cooler and moister such as kind of low-lying areas or north facing slopes the, the tr tree species that are going to do well on those areas are, are, are going to be very different. We really want to be matching the species to the conditions. Similar to um, frequently flooded areas, we don't want to be planting trees that don't like to have wet feet, obviously. Um, and, you know, as extreme events increase, you know, looking to where those low-lying areas that might be flood prone, um, we want to make sure that that the trees that are being planted in those areas are appropriate for those sites. <clears throat> um, and so, you know, just to, we already, we already saw this in Danielle's presentation, but just to reemphasize that we've got a lot of different examples um, on our website. And so, you know, um, we'll go through one in particular here and uh, after we have time for questions, but, you know, these demonstration projects provide a lot of uh, examples and real world scenarios where people are, are really integrating this information on climate vulnerability and finding those co-benefits. Um, and so I would encourage you to, you know, check, check those demonstration projects out. And then um, that bottom link there as well um, will get you to more information on the forest carbon management menu and some additional resources that we have um, some recorded presentations and, and uh, other resources for carbon management. So I think with that, I'll, I'll just pause and uh